In this video, I wanted to share with you the methodology that I used in order to pass the OSCP exam. And definitely if you have your sights set on the OSCP exam as well, one thing you're really going to want to do as soon as possible, if you're not already, get that hands-on experience. It's so crucial and the number one factor between if you can pass it uh, or not on your first try or even on any attempt for that matter. And along with that, I'm very excited to announce the Hack This Server Challenge. It's going to start up Monday. Uh, it's a three-day challenge, so from March uh, 6th through the 8th, uh, you'll have the three days to try and hack into a server that I built myself and deployed out there on the cloud. And the first person to do so will win a free pair of iProd Pros. And it's going to be super helpful to anyone um, this trying to get into this field, to be quite honest, because even if you're not the first to hack it, there's going to be so much stuff that you learn along the way, and that's just super crucial. So uh, following those three days, I'm going to be doing a free bonus webinar for you guys as well. You definitely don't want to miss that. So uh, yeah, the link is in the description to register for that. So go and do that right now, absolutely for free, and I will see you guys in the challenge. Now, getting into the video here is... There's a number of tools that are really useful to use and just going through like um, some of the basic content that Offsec provides is pretty helpful when it comes to web. Like I have my opinions on it when it came to Active Directory. I didn't think it was that useful, but their web stuff is pretty solid. So I would recommend also utilizing the PDF they gave you um, for some of this stuff. But I want to highlight some commands and some tools that I found really useful uh, for OSCP. So the thing about web is it's a super large attack surface, right? And so there's so many things you could potentially go up against. Number one, let's start with the web browser. You want to make sure that you have things set up to make this as easy as possible. There's a few extensions that I like, and I guess it's kind of ideal because I don't have them set up already. The first one is an extension called Foxy Proxy. And you could do all this stuff through your network settings in Firefox, but this just makes it a lot faster and easier to switch between your settings. So if I go to getfoxyproxy.org, um, I guess you could download it through that. I actually don't typically do it this way. I'll just get it through Mozilla add-ons. Yeah. You just hit add to Firefox. And from here, you want to configure this to be able to use burp. So the way you can do this is just go into options and we're going to add a new one. And I used like to call it burp or something like that. So I know what it is. We keep it on HTTP proxy type and you want to put the IP of your local host, 127.0.0.1 and burp suite will default to port 8080. So you want to set that and you don't need anything for the username password. So I hit save, and so now anytime I want to proxy my traffic through Burp, I can easily do that just by clicking the extension and clicking Burp. And similarly, I can turn it off, just put the turn off button as opposed to having to dig through your network settings. So that's the first thing. The next thing is I would highly recommend another add-on called Wappalizer. And there's a couple other add-ons that could do the same thing as Wappalizer. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a lot of options out there. I used to know of a few more, but this is the one that I normally use. And what it's going to do is it's going to look through like uh, files on the uh, on the front end and uh, things like that. So like looking through like JavaScript files and um, fingerprints from the server and all that stuff, uh, like the server headers. And it's going to try to enumerate the web stack that you're up against. So uh, let's just go to any example site, maybe GitHub. So I'm on GitHub, right? And you see this starts populating with a number here. If I click this, it's gonna tell me, it's gonna try to determine what's running on this github.com page. So it sees there's Webpack on the front end, open graph, all this stuff. Uh, looks like some AWS, Amazon S3s for content delivery and so on. Sometimes, depending on what you're up against, you might it might be able to enumerate like a backend language like PHP or Java or something like that, right? 
and some JavaScript frameworks, whatever it can find. And that can be very useful. Sometimes it will be able to tell you the exact uh, version number of something. And it's just getting that through the like, JavaScript files and stuff. I can almost guarantee that if we really dug into the JavaScript in the front end, we'll see this library ver in, with this specific version listed as well. So it, it saves you a lot of time in that sense. Uh, definitely a handy add-on to have. So beyond the browser, what I would recommend as far as like the actual uh, methodology is that I would browse the site normally as, as a user, as a regular user, right? And so you want to you wanna really try to look at it like a normal user rather than just trying to hack it right away. That's the script kitties trick, uh, uh, the script, the script kitties um, trap. I would say, is trying to hack it right away. And of course, offensive security, they know this, right? I mean, there's notoriously going to be a lot of rabbit holes at play. And one of the ways they can uh, take advantage of the inexperienced pen tester or the script kitty is to make it such that if you were to approach this site by trying to hack it right away, you're going to go down a rabbit hole. So what you want to do is just approach it like a normal user Make note of things to come back to later, but I like to start with the low-hanging fruit. And now here's a really key tip. No matter what you're doing, you always want to make sure that at pretty much all times you have scans going on in the background. So when I'm initially enumerating the site, I want to make sure I have my Nmap scans running. Uh, I'm going to make sure I have my GoBuster running. And what I will say with GoBuster is you don't have to use GoBuster but you need to use some kind of subdirectory, uh, a, a tool that can do subdirectory brute forcing, whether it's WFuzz or Fuff or Russ, uh, what was it, Pharaoh Buster, right, or Go Buster or Dirt Search, whatever it is, um, have something that can do that. So I'll just run like a Go Buster command, start enumerating the subdirectories. A lot of the web stuff, what makes it tricky is it's very much based off of what you're seeing, what you're up against, right? For example, my strategy changes if I see that it's a WordPress site. Because if it's WordPress, I'm going to run something like WP scan, try to enumerate um, potential vulnerabilities in either the version of WordPress they're running if it's out of date and vulnerable to something major, right? or maybe a vulnerable plugin that might be running on the WordPress server. So it really depends on what you're up against. That's a pivot that I would make if I noticed I was up against that. If I was up against any kind of arbitrary CMS, content management system, I would try to see, okay, what is the name of the software that's running? Is it a third-party software? That's a thing that really hugely, wildly dictates the next steps you should be taking because if you notice that... It is a third-party site, then maybe you can find a known vulnerability on exploit DB. So if I have the name of something, then I might look for known vulnerabilities for that. If I see something severe, like say a SQL injection or like a remote code execution vulnerability, the next step is I want to see if I can confirm the version number of the software that's running. Because if I can then I can confirm if it's vulnerable or not. You know, you don't want to just throw random exploits at these boxes. That's another script kitty trap. Uh, because if you do, you know, you might be debugging the exploit for hours and it's not even the intended route. Um, but then for another thing, you know, if you're doing that on an actual assessment, you know, you could have negative impacts on the, on the server and stuff like that, right? You could degrade the performance, bring things down even. So you want to make sure that you're doing your due diligence. So try to confirm the version of the software that's vulnerable uh, first, right? Or at least look at the code of the exploit and have an understanding of what it's doing. And that's another thing. Whether it's web exploitation or network exploitation in OSCP, they're going to really challenge you to at least be able to read the code that you're you know, running exploits for because typically those exploits are not going to work out of the box and you have to be comfortable with that. You got to be comfortable with some basic debugging. One thing that I would recommend, and the reason I'm bringing this up during the web methodology, is that this can happen a lot 
uh, on web exploits and stuff too is you might be in a situation where your exploit is not working, right? For whatever reason, and it it might not be the most cleanly coded exploit. It might not give you very, you might not be getting very useful um, error messages and things like that. It might not be immediately apparent what you need to do to fix it. So in that case, I would definitely recommend with whatever IDE or code editor you use, Learn how to do some debugging. Learn how to how to actually debug code. And the reason that the debugger is so useful is that when you are, you know, troubleshooting, you can set breakpoints at particular areas in the code, and you can see like, okay, what is the value of this variable at this point? And you can just kind of step through it and see why, like, where the error occurs, and then you can start to figure out why and how you can fix that. Will be way more clear to you. So I wanted to point that out as well. Some other things you could get going in the background is if like, for example, if it's using vhost, a like virtual host routing, if you notice that, like when you put in the IP address, it tried to take you to a host name. Well, then you need to add that to your host files. And I would start looking at other subdomains that might exist. So I would do some subdomain in new uh, brute forcing. Basically I would do that through GoBuster personally, but you can also use Fuff bunch of different tools, WFuzz, whatever you prefer. Another thing you want to do is if you find a login page or anywhere that you suspect that SQL might be involved, a database might be involved. Like for some examples, if you see that there's some things that are persistent in the application, they're being stored somehow. And, and the way they're being stored is a, a database most likely. So there's some queries being uh, you know, at play here to store and retrieve that data. Well, maybe there's a SQL injection vulnerability in a uh, parameter. So you uh, you could start looking into that manually because you cannot use SQL map, right, on the on the OSCP, right? So just keep that in mind. Uh, that was one thing that uh, I had to very be, con be conscious of because when I do... Um, when I do real world pen testing or um, CTFs and things like that, that would be another thing I would typically run in the background would be SQL map. But yeah, don't do that on the OSCP uh, because yeah, your attempt will uh, be an auto fail <laughs> at that point because you're not allowed to use that tool. Um, and that speaks to how strong the tool is. But I would definitely, if I suspect SQL to be used, I would, I would enter like a single tick mark, right? And start entering some data, see how the application responds to it. Uh, I would, you know, you could use Wappalizer and stuff like that and see like, okay, it's using this tech stack. It's probably, it, it might be this database that might kind of tip you off on it. Um, there's all kinds of database enumeration techniques that you can use as well that I would like to cover in, a, in another video that is specifically helpful for OSCP where you have to do it manually. There's a really, there's some really cool tricks to be able to figure out what the backend database is if it's not apparent, like if it's MySQL or MSSQL, Postgres, etc. cetera. Uh, there are some cool techniques that you can employ for that, but that's for a, a later time uh, to get into that topic. Those are some of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about right off the bat, but it is very dynamic depending on what you're up against, but always I'm going to browse the application as a normal user. I'm going to have Nmap going in the background. I'm going to have uh, GoBuster, my dog, uh, in the background there. Just had to take him to the uh, to the vet for the for the snip. That's why he's got the uh, the cone on his head. Um, don't mind him. But uh, yeah, those are the things that I'm always going to be running, always looking at. Now, also along those lines, your Nmap scan might reveal some other web servers running on different ports. So I would definitely for OSCP make note of the different things that you might want to come back and look into later and uh, move on to those other web servers. Look at everything. Try to find those low hanging fruit issues first, right? I would pay close attention to the parameters that you're looking at that you come across as well, right? If I see a file path in like a URL or somewhere in the application, I'm going to look for local file inclusion. If I suspect that the output on the page looks like it came from a Linux command, I'm going to look for a command injection. If I suspect that there is a templating engine used, if the backend language is, say, Python, and 
you know, it looks like they might be using uh, like a, a templating engine like Jinja or something like that. I'm going to look for server side template injection. A lot of it you're going to get with experience and, and kind of understanding like languages and frameworks and stuff like that. Uh, but just to give you a few ideas, those are some of the things I would look for in the situation I'd look for them in. Definitely let me know in the comments section below if there's something you would like me to go more in depth on. It's kind of hard to, to tackle. Out of all the methodologies you could tackle, web pen testing is pretty, t uh, pretty tough because it's so dependent on what you're seeing, what you're up against. And it, with something like Active Directory, like you can have like a massive mind map on it. It's actually pretty useful. But for web, the attack surface is literally infinite. So it is pretty tough. Let me know in the comment section below what you'd like to hear me speak to more. Maybe some example scenarios that we could work off of. And, uh, and we can go from there. But I'll see you guys in the videos on screen right now. And thanks for watching.